All right, it's great to have you guys back tonight. How many first timers here? Anybody here for the first time? Wow, good to have you. Great to have you. Oh. Uh, perfect attendance. How many? Six for six. Wow. All right. Commencement is coming soon. Hey, let, one thing I do want to tell you is a part of the Alpha course, I haven't mentioned it to you yet, and typically we do this earlier, is something we call just the Alpha Weekend. And we actually go over session 9 and 10. It's a Friday night and a Saturday morning. So it's dinner Friday night, Saturday morning from till about noon, 12, 15. So that is October 28th. I don't, we don't have registration for that tonight, do we? Okay. So October 28th and 29th, you may just want to make a mental note of that. So Friday night, the 28th, dinner, 6.30. Saturday morning starts at 8.30. And let me tell you, this breakfast put Shoney's to shame. I mean, we're talking a spread like you will not imagine. You know that strawberry gook stuff that they put out there? It's amazing. So it is a phenomenal time. It's actually set, it's a part of the course. We didn't just decide to add it in because you guys aren't getting it. It's actually a part of the course. So we are... We're happy that, we'd have to, happy to have you here. Unfortunately for that, I hate to say that, but there's no alpha for kids that night, so, for, or, or the next morning. So that's just time, so if you need uh, somebody to watch your kids, just kind of start working on that right now. But October 28th and 29th, I want you to be a part of it. Tonight, why and how do I pray? Um, before we get into that, uh, I just I want to kind of back up a little bit, go over some of the things we talked about last week. I, I, um, some of these uh, analogies, I don't know how much they stick, um, and 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 all analogies fall a little bit short. But I but this 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 uh, analogy of uh, the wheelbarrow, you know, how do you see yourself? Oh my God. Okay. It wasn't really that big of a deal, I got the, No, I got that thing on my, on my email. Oh, okay. All right. <laughs> I called City Business. Anybody else need to finish with their cell phone before we're done here? We can just... <laughs> <laughs> I was just putting the... I know, I know, I know, I know. I don't forget. Oh, that's very good. <laughs> so anyway, um, anyway, how do you see yourself? Now, we talked about the fact that maybe you're just curious. Maybe you have really not examined much about the person of Jesus Christ in the past. You've gone to church, but it's just something you do to keep your, your, you know, your folks at bay. Something you just do. It's because you what you do. It's a quiet moment or time, an hour, whatever. Um, you really don't have given much thought to this issue of faith. That's great. So glad you're still coming. Um, maybe you're convinced. Maybe your whole life you have prayed. You have gone to church. You have thought about God. Uh, you're convinced, but you've never actually surrendered your life to Him. You've never trusted that it is only the work of the cross of Jesus Christ, according to the Bible, that we are forgiven and accepted by God. That's, and what that means is I am surrendering my whole life, control of my whole life, over to Him. That means the way in which my life was going, even with God as a part of my life, I am turning in a different direction and saying, God, I don't want you to be my co-pilot. I want you to be my pilot. I want you to control my life. I surrender my life to you. So when we share this analogy of Blondin last week and talk about his being able to take a person and put them in a wheelbarrow and take them from one side of the falls to the next, you can be convinced that he can take you from one side of the falls to the next because he showed that he could do that but you never get into the wheelbarrow that's being committed do you see that I can stand there and go yeah I believe you can but I'm not getting in <laughs> right but last week we added another a twist to that where suddenly there's a fire raging and that fire is approaching you and there's no way of exit except running through the fire or doing the tightrope yourself or maybe diving off the falls or listening to Blondin tell you one more time where it's not a publicity stunt but a matter of life and death and he says, I can take a person, put them in a wheelbarrow and take them from one side of the falls to the next. Would you like to get in? Because now you see something that is not just a nice religious 
moment that you have once a week with God, you see what Blondin offers you is a matter of life or death. See, when we talk about the issue of being committed, we're seeing this as an issue of life and death. That Jesus comes to offer us life instead of death. And so when we, when we look at this analogy, I also want us to understand that when we talk about the word commitment, when you and I typically think about the word commitment, we think about we're going to double our effort, right? We're going to, I'm going to, you know, I've been spiritual in the past, but coming to Alpha, I'm going to go to church twice a month now, okay? Or I'm going to do my best to, I'm going to give more money in the, I'm just going to be a better person. That's not what we're talking about here. When you get in the wheelbarrow, when you surrender your life to Christ, when you repent, when you turn the other way and go this way and say, an, an end of that life, to, and I'm going in this direction, basically, what we're saying is, I am going to be committed to Blondin's commitment to get me from one side of the falls to the next. Do you see that? What is the commitment that Blondin is looking for? Does he get halfway through the falls and say, look, i got to go back and i got a few more people. Will you just go ahead and make the rest of your way here? <laughs> now that's what maybe some of us think. It may be some trick. It starts that way. But what do I have to do after I've joined the club? But it's commit, being committed to Blondin's commitment to get us from one side of the falls to the next. Right? Now, just imagine for a moment, um, you... You get on an airplane. How, what is the commitment that the pilot is looking for you to get you from one side of, from the airport in New Orleans, let's say to the airport in New York? Does he need your help? Is he looking for your assistance? Okay. Well, a, a, religious, a religious way of looking at that is, let's say we need to get from, to, from New Orleans to New York in and, and, and three hours. The pilot's going to welcome you to come sit down on the plane. And he's not going to look for your assistance in flying at all. Okay, at least if it's, if it's a decent airline. He's not going to do that, right? Well, let's say you, you want to surrender your life to Jesus Christ. You want to be committed to Him. And let's say He welcomes you onto, you know, air heaven or what, whatever it would be. You come down the gangway. This is religion's view of this. You come down the gangway or the jetway, whatever word you prefer. Jesus is standing there. You have surrendered to Him. You're getting on board the plane. You're surrendering control of your life to Him. And He hugs you. He says, I'm so glad you're here. Then He turns you around, grabs you by the nap of the neck, throws you in the pilot seat, and says, now you better fly this sucker, and you better fly it right. Or I'm bringing this whole thing down. Now, in a way, as peculiar of an analogy that is, in a way, that's kind of what we're thinking. If I get on, am I going to have to fly this plane? Am I going to have to direct my life in just the right way? Okay, so I surrender. What do I have to do now? That's a picture of a, a works-based religion. Okay. Now, if, on the other hand, I'm looking at this from a biblical Christian perspective, I go down the runway, the gangway, Jesus is waiting for me, he hugs me, he says, son, daughter, I am so glad you have committed your life to me. And instead of ushering us to the pilot seat, he ushers us to first class and he says, now, I want you to sit here, I want you to stay buckled in. Throughout the course of this flight, there are going to be some, some turbulence. There are going to be some times you think the plane is crashing. But I want you through the whole time to not try to come through the pilot's door, through the cockpit door. I want you to rest and trust in me. Well, now what is that? That is my commitment to his commitment to get me through life into heaven and beyond. Do you see the difference? It's a surrendering of myself to his commitment. To surrendering of control of my life to His ability. And so when I say yes to Him, I stop saying no to a performance-driven life whereby God owes me based on how well I'm doing. I understand and begin to see that no more deals with God. The deal has been made for me through Jesus' work on the cross. And I now become committed to His commitment 
his commitment to me. So, and we see that when we, when we come to know Christ, when we surrender our lives to him, when we're committed, okay, it, there's, it's just the beginning. It's just the beginning. Marriage is just the beginning, right? Now, some would say, yeah, just the beginning of what? Um, <laughs> Think about that. We talked about the analogy last week. Annette, come, Annette and I standing before the minister and we say, I do. All right? And until I say and she says, I do, <clears throat> we haven't. We can, I can, remember I said I can believe all the right things about Annette? She's beautiful, great cook, dad's rich. Okay? All those things are great. Okay? But until I say, I do, I haven't. And when I say, I do, remember we talked about last week, at every wedding, there is a funeral Right? There is the death of singleness. There is relinquishing of identity separate from the other. And I die to single me to be joined. You are no longer two, but one. But it's just the beginning. I mean, imagine for a, a moment. So let's say Annette and I have the ceremony. We're married we go back down the altar. We go to the outside the church. Everybody's standing there with whatever the ecologically accepted things are that you can throw <laughs> at weddings now so birds don't choke, things like that. Um, um, so, and imagine instead of, you know, what do you normally see? You see outside, you one limousine, right? One limousine. Well, at this wedding, you see two limousines. They're heading in opposite directions. They're sitting with their... Uh, the tails of the cars, the limousines, backed up to one another. And so Annette gets in one limo and I get in the other limo. We pop our heads up and as the limos drive off in opposite directions, we snap and waving to one another. That was wonderful. It was a great experience. Why don't we get together some other time in the future and we can talk about how great this was? Now, that's in, now maybe some of you wish that's what would have happened. But how insane is that? Right? It's just the beginning. There's not a ceremony that takes place and that's the end of it. It's just the beginning of a commitment that says better, worse, sickness, health, richer, poorer, till death do we part. <coughs> and that's the commitment that we made. See, so, so what do I do with that? So when that tells me, one day she says, Frank, I love you. This, is, this was a beautiful moment. If you could just be there with me right now. Um, Frank, um, I want you to know that I love you no matter what you do. Even if you're unfaithful, I will be faithful to you. So, I, I wish she could, she could come up here right now so we could reenact that come moment. On, no, 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 that's all right. That's all right. She's fine. <laughs> so, um, so, I... We hugged, and in my mind, if you could see my thought monitor, I'm thinking, you know, I'm really not that far from Airline Highway. <laughs> Where there are all these wonderful hotels. Right. Now, is that what I'm thinking? Well, she said no matter what. Right? No, that is not what I'm thinking. I'm thinking this woman loves me, and the response to love is love. So when I'm looking at the fact that Jesus says, I want all of you and I will never leave you and I will never turn my back. I will never let you go. What do I go? Well, pff, I'm just going to sin like hell. If that's the case, I just do whatever I want. That's not the response of love. Love responds with caring, obedient, thoughtful, selfless love. And that's what we're talking about here. A life that gives itself into a love that is greater than anything I could ever respond to properly. That's what biblical Christianity is. Entering into a relationship with God where saying I do, getting in the wheelbarrow, receiving the gift is just the beginning. And so tonight when we talk about prayer... Prayer is what takes place to where a relationship with God, a getting in the wheelbarrow, is, is enhanced. It matures. It grows in intimacy. 
So, and, so the, and, and you know, maybe even, I'm going to get so into trying to qualify what happened last week, I'll never get into this week. Um, but I think this is important. There may have been some of you last week, as I encouraged you to just have a little conversation with God, that said, you know, I prayed that, or I said those words to God, but I didn't feel anything. Can I just encourage you? Um, the issue of surrendering to the Lord is not about feeling something. Maybe you do feel, did feel something. Maybe you didn't feel something. The question is, or the issue is, if by faith you said, Jesus, I give you the controls of my life, control of my life, take over. He did that. If you did that by faith, believing that he did that. And the issue is not whether you and I feel that way or not. If I feel like a Loria, I'm a Loria. If I don't, let's say I'm just walking all of a sudden now and the speaker falls, hit me in the head, hits me in the head, I have amnesia. And I think I'm a bourgeois. Okay? <laughs> well, because I don't feel like a Loria. Because I don't know that I'm a Loria. What am I? Am I a bourgeois? I'm a Loria, but I don't feel like it. What if I don't feel married? I'm in trouble. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> see, the, the issue is faith. Faith continues to walk when the feelings wane. We're going to talk more about this in the coming weeks. But if these are important things. Now, how, this seems so subjective. How do I know that? The Bible says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved, shall be his, shall be forgiven, shall be accepted, shall never be let go of by an almighty, all-loving God. That's what he said. If the Bible is truth, is the truth, we can count on that so that when my feelings are out of control, I can stand firm to what I know is true when I don't feel like it's true. It's important. And so tonight when we talk about prayer, when Keith talked about the Bible two weeks ago, these are, these are, are conduits to our growing in intimacy with God. Because everything about the God of the Bible is intimacy. Everything is about communication. You know, all of life is about communication. So, you know, tonight as we talk about prayer, I, I you'd like to use a different word. Just, you know, conversation, interaction. These, these are the things we're talking about. We just throw the word, prayer has been turned upside down. It has all the meaning has been, been taken out of it. It's just prayer, prayer, prayer. What does that mean, really? So we're going to talk a little bit more about that tonight, what it is. But all of life is about communication, isn't it? I mean, particularly with technology today. Just, we just go about 30 years the way technology has advanced. Why? So we can communicate more, we can communicate quicker. There's an article I came upon here um, about uh, communications. It says, after having dug to a depth of 10 feet last year, New York scientists found traces of copper, wa copper wire dating back 100 years and came to the conclusion that their ancestors already had a telephone system more than 100 years ago. Well, not to be outdone by the New Yorkers, in the weeks that followed, California scientists dug to a depth of 20 feet Shortly thereafter, headlines in the Los Angeles Times read, California archaeologists have found traces of 200-year-old copper wire and have concluded that their ancestors already had an advanced high-tech communication system a hundred years earlier than the New Yorkers. One week later, the Daily Advertiser, a local newspaper in Eunice, Louisiana, reported the following. After digging as deep as 30 feet in rice fields near Forked Island, Boudreaux, a self-taught archaeologist, <laughs> reported that he found absolutely nothing. <laughs> Boudreaux has therefore concluded that at least 300 years ago, Louisiana had already gone wireless. <laughs> 
That, that is the state we are in. So Louisiana, always on the cutting edge. All right, so tonight we'll just have an introduction. This is an introduction to prayer. We're going to scratch the surface. All right, in the next 35 minutes, I hope. So first, what is prayer not? Prayer is not, let's make a deal. We've been talking about that, right? Prayer is not saying, okay, if you pray 10 of these 10 times or 20 times, you'll get this or that. This is, we're not, this is not meology. This is not where, you know, we, we build up the currency, right, of our good works to where we get the blessed vending machine of God to give us what we want and not what we don't want. That is meology. That is transactional. It is not relational. It's going to the convenience store because you want a Milky Way bar. All right? You want to buy some gasoline. Okay? That is not what prayer is. We do not go to God to get something and then say thank you and we leave our good works on the counter and we're even for a while. Prayer is, though, the most important activity of our lives. It is interaction with God. It is interaction with the Godhead, the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, all are involved with this. And just as we've talked about stereotypes of the Bible, there are stereotypes of prayer that keep us from properly, biblically, intimately communicating with God. And the Bible is instrumental in teaching you and me what prayer being with God is and what it is is not. So Oswald Chambers, teacher, missionary, writes, prayer is not a means of developing ourselves or getting what we want from God. Prayer is the nourishment of God's life in us. Prayer is the way we get to know God. Now look, we talked last week about, I can't spend too much time with this here. Prayer is the nourishment of God's life in us. Now you guys remember last week, and it's amazing I went to the store and I could find two more of these. It's incredible. Um, just how lucky was I? Um, so you remember, we talked about the fact that whoever has not committed, whoever has not said I do, according to the Bible, is still in Adam, separated from God. Therefore, in, in, in the Bible, death is separation. Right? When we have surrendered our lives to Christ, when we've gotten in the wheelbarrow, said I do, received the gift, when we have said, I don't want my life to be in my control anymore, I recognize I have a need that's bigger than I, and I want my life to go in the other way, and I say, Jesus, come take control of my life, I acknowledge my need for you. Okay? The Bible says that we become new creatures, and God places us into the life of Christ. This life is destroyed and we're placed into the life of Christ. Before then, we're in Adam, and what you're feeling, I believe, is God jostling you, okay? Just like he jostled me. I'm hearing things maybe I haven't heard before. I'm experiencing things I haven't heard before, uh, experienced before. I'm sensing like maybe God actually does care, and I want to know that, but this is not something I'm used to hearing, see? But when you and I finally open our lives to Christ, he gives us his life. He gives us eternal life. And so prayer, which is communication, interaction, conversation with God, is the nourishment of the new life that we have in Christ. It's the way we get to know God. You know, I... I no, I can't. I can't. Yeah, I can't. Um, okay, who watched the Saints game Sunday? Okay, so you will admit it since we won, right? Okay. Um, <laughs> Well, uh, okay, just hold on to that thought and we'll come back to it. So prayer, we see, is two-way conversation. It's talking to God. It's listening to God. It's not just talking. It's not just reading. It's not just singing. It's listening as well. Okay, and, and, and God speaks to us. He speaks to us in many ways. He speaks to us through our senses. He speaks to us through others. He speaks to us through circumstances, through the Bible. Prayer, hear this, if what the Bible tells me is true, prayer is my lifeline. Conversation, communication, interaction with God is my lifeline to, to Him. Just like it is, if you think about it, in terms of every relationship and the growth of every relationship on the planet. So, number one, why pray? Well, that's a, that's a good question. 
And there's really one, one really good answer. If the Bible's true, God instructs us to. God, okay, the one who created everything, says, I want to communicate with you. I want you to experience me. He, who knows all things, is totally perfect, says, I want to communicate with you who are totally imperfect and need me. I want to reveal myself to you. I want you to know me. Okay? Okay? And the Bible tells us that prayer is addressed. We're just going to look for a moment here, just how the Bible leads us and how, you know, how we pray, that prayer is addressed to the Father. Look at this in Matthew chapter 6. This is Jesus speaking about prayer, real close here to what we call the Lord's Prayer. Verse, we're going to be getting there in a little bit. Jesus says, but when you pray, when you communicate with God, when you converse with Him, when you interact with God, not catch the, what I want us to see here is the intimacy of this. All right? Just see the intimacy of this. Jesus is not saying this is the only way to pray, but, but the point that Jesus is getting across to you and to me is to hear that God is very intentional about intimate, one-on-one -on -one communication. When you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Do, do you see what's being said here? It's not just about, hey, go to your room, close the door, and pray for 10 minutes, and don't stop till I tell you, or whatever. What God is telling us here, what Jesus is telling us here, is that God wants you and me to get alone with Him, and experience Him, and talk to Him. Okay? That's amazing. And, it's, and the reward, I will tell you that the reward is not necessarily getting something that you and I think we want. It's getting a revelation of more of Him, which is greater than any temporary thing you and I could ever ask for. So, prayer is directed to the Father. It's a dad who loves to be with his kids. And then the Bible tells us that prayer is through the Son. Paul writes to the church in Ephesus, for through him, Jesus, we both, when we talk about both there, that's Jews and Gentiles, have access to the Father by one Spirit. And so Jesus, we see, he says, for, uh, chapter, pardon me, session one of Alpha, Jesus, John chapter 14, verse 6, Jesus says, I am the way to the Father. I am the truth about the Father. I am the life that we present to the Father. We have, now, now look at this, we have access to the Father by one Spirit. Do you see what this is telling you and me about prayer? That is that God expects and wants all of us to go directly to Him when we pray. I mean, imagine if you work for a Fortune 1 company. You work for the biggest company in the world. It used to be Exxon Mobil. I don't know what it is now. It doesn't matter. You just get hired on by, by ExxonMobil, let's say. The chief executive officer comes and he knocks on your door. And he says to you, Hey, at any time, whenever you have an issue or you have a question, I want you to come directly to my office. Don't go to your manager. Don't go to your supervisor. Don't go to a peer. I want you to come directly to me. I've made a way for you to be directly in touch with me. How do you think you'd feel about that? <laughs> Say, are you lying? Is this true? How do you think you'd feel about that? Wouldn't that be pretty amazing? I mean, how big is ExxonMobil all over the world? Come directly to me. Now, here's what the God of the universe says. I don't want you to go to one of my managers, whoever that would be, or supervisor, or peer. I want you to go directly to me. You have access to... Don't stop anywhere along the way. I want you to come directly to me. Now, if God is big as I think he is, and he's a whole lot bigger than I think he is, that should overwhelm us. The fact that the CEO of ExxonMobil would want you to come directly to him is pretty cool. That doesn't begin to compare to the fact that the God of the universe has made a way for you and me to come directly to him. 
We have access to the Father by one Spirit. And then Jesus tells us, look at this. There is one God and one mediator between man and God. It's the man Christ Jesus. The one who makes the way for us is, the, is Jesus and what he did. He is the mediator. He is the one that brings me to God, who ushers me to God. And then the Bible says that we, that we, can, we pray in the Spirit. This is where the Holy Spirit gets involved. I love this. Look at this. Paul writes, in the same way, the Spirit helps us. So when we have surrendered our lives to God, we receive Jesus Christ. The Bible tells us that the Spirit of God comes to live in us. And look what it says. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for. You ever felt like that? You're lying to me if you haven't. You've never prayed if that's not the case. There are many of you right now you don't know what to pray for. There, there, right now there's some things I don't really know how to pray. But if you've continued reading while I've been talking, we, we don't have to pray for. But the Spirit Himself intercedes for us with groans that words cannot express. Isn't that amazing? The God Himself, the Spirit of God Himself is interceding for us. Do you think that tells me that God may be for me? That He is for me? That He wants me to experience Him? And that is what prayer is. Prayer is for the purpose of communicating with God, which results in developing a deeper and deeper relationship. But prayer is not dialogue with just anybody. Not just some political survey call at dinner time. You getting any of those lately? Gee. I mean, what if tonight... Just what if? I mean, just think about this for a moment. Let's see. What if the President of the United States were to call you tonight? I mean, how would you, how would you feel about that? I have no problem. Okay? I mean, but if, if the President called you, would that kind of get your attention? It's, it's him again. Yes, Mr. President? <laughs> yeah, I'm kind of tied up right now. Yes, sir? An alpha course for the Congress? <laughs> well, sir, uh, we could talk about that, but um, yeah, if, if I could get back with you, that would be helpful. Yes, sir? Yeah, I, I, no, I would not sign that that executive order. No, sir. I would not do that one. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We'll, I'll talk to you more about Syria in a little bit. Okay. Thank you. I, 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 seems like every alpha he calls and, and, and interrupts what we're doing here. But, but, okay. But imagine, I mean, no matter what your political affiliation is, all right? Republican, Democrat, Communist, Independent, independent what, whatever you may. Would, wouldn't you be amazed if you got that? Hey, it, it's the president, Stephanie. He wants to talk to you. Now, wouldn't that, like, me? Yeah. Hey, hey. It's God who created all things. <coughs> Not only does he want to have a 30-second conversation with you, he wants to talk to you now and for the rest of your life and into eternity. Now that is what the Bible tells us about this God who is so intimate, who is so relational, who so loved us that he gave his son to prove it. Not just so we have some ceremony where we just say, I do. I'll take the gift. I'll get in the wheelbarrow. A lifelong and an eternity long of knowing Him more and more and more. It's amazing. Even God's name, look at this, even God's name speaks communication. Look at this. John chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word. See that? And the Word was with God, right? The Word was with, and the Word was God. But this is speaking of Jesus. In the beginning was, but look at his name. Even his name says, I'm relating. I'm interacting. I'm conversing. 
I'm communicating. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. See, God spoke the Word in the beginning, in Genesis, and creation took place. The creation of the heavens and earth took place. God brought the Word to be the Savior of mankind and redemption and recreation was spoken into a dead world so that we could be redeemed. John chapter 17, this is Jesus' prayer to his Father. He says, this is eternal life. Now, this has got my attention. This is, you want to know what eternal life is? Jesus is about to tell us. This is eternal life that you know how to keep all the rules. That you know what time Sunday service is. That you know what's right and what's wrong. Now I guarantee you that would have been my answer or something, something do, having to do with me keeping the rules. Something with me being where I'm supposed to be and not being where I'm not supposed to be. That would be me. But that's not what Jesus says here. Look at what he says here, which again confirms his desire for you. You. Not you. You, 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 me. To know him. Look at what he says. Here's eternal life. That you know the Father and Jesus Christ whom he sent. How's that happen? How do you get to know anybody? You spend time with him, right? Thank you. How do you get to know the Father? You spend time with Him. You know the Father, the Son. That's what eternal life is. Not about getting something and trying to hold on to that something, but knowing someone, and that someone just happens to be the God who created the universe, that in spite of my rebellion, my rebellion against Him, came to rescue me if I would let him rescue me. So how do we know anyone? How do we know anyone? Let's see here. Tommy and Tammy are not here tonight. Okay. Who am I going to work on here? Oh, I've got to get Alex here. Okay, Alex. It's not, is it Nancy? I can't just want to yeah, it, it is Nancy. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Are you nervous? No. Well, it's, there's time. Um, maybe I should do this with Nancy. Oh, come on. Um, no, let's go ahead and do this. Um, Alex, uh, how long have you known uh, Nancy? 33 years. 33 years. Can you guys hear this enough? 33 years. Um, how much did you trust her 35 years ago? Zero. Why? Because I didn't know her. Because you didn't know her. How much did you trust her 34 years ago? Zero. Okay. How much did you trust her 31 years ago? 100%. 100%? 31 years ago? Yes. Nancy, how much did you trust him <laughs> 31 years ago? Maybe 75%. 75%, okay. How about... Uh, yeah. Um, how long have you guys been married? 31 years. 31? I hit 31 years. Okay, so when you married him, you trusted him 75%. Yes. Wow. Because there are yeah. some things I didn't know about him. Yeah, but I mean, most people don't know they don't know those things about him until it's way too late. <laughs> 31 years later. 31 years later. So why did you trust him more 31 years ago, uh, ago than you did 33 years ago? Because I didn't know him that well 33 years ago. Right. And so what happened in those two years? You got, you got to know got him married, more. You got to know him more. Got to know him. That's right. You got to know him more. And how about 25 years ago? Yeah, 100%. 100%. Okay. Okay, that's good. Are you still at 100%? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, okay. So why did, why, did you, why did you trust him more at 25 years ago than 31 years ago? Um, because we have gone through life together. Right, at right. That point. Right. And, and the more you knew good. him, 
right? The more you knew him, the more you loved him. The more you loved him, right? The more you loved him, the more you him. trusted him. Did you trust him? Yeah, trusted trust him. him. That's good. That's good to know. Okay, we're not trying to get into a marriage counseling thing here. Okay. This, so the more, the more you knew him, the more you knew her, mm -hmm. the more you talked. Right? The more you talked. Converse. Right. You communicated. Do you remember those days? Huh? Okay. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh, so the more you knew her, the more you trusted her. Right? The more you trusted her, the more you loved her. And the more you loved her, what? The more you wanted to do things for her? Oh, yeah. Oh. <laughs> okay. I know Alex doesn't want to hear that. You know, I know it's, it's the son over here. So, right, so, and and what happens when you serve more? The more you, the more you, the more that you know, the more you trust, the more the trust, the more you love, the more you love, the more you serve, the more you serve, the more you know, and you know more, and you trust more, and you love more, and you serve more, and that's what happens. That's the picture that God gives us. Certainly, we're an imperfect picture of that, but that's the picture we get. The more we know Him. The more we trust Him, the more we trust Him, the more we love Him, the more we love Him, the more it is a desire to serve Him out of love, not out of religious obligation. It's not, when I do the dishes at home, I love my wife. Um, I do. My nails are a mess because of it. But I love to, thank you guys both, by the way, thank you so much. And so, I mean, so that's, and that's great that it, when it works, when it works out that way, but it doesn't always, it doesn't always, this is a, a great, great couple, but they didn't exactly have the same story as Alex and Nancy. Um, actually, um, this dear man and his, I mean, she seems quiet here, but she's really a very never-ending, nagging wife. They, they went on a vacation to Jerusalem, and, and while they were there, she passed away. Um, the undertaker came and told the husband, you can have her shipped home for $15,000, or we can bury her here in Jerusalem for $150. The man thought about it and he said, well, I think I'm just going to go ahead and have her shipped home. The undertaker said, why? Why would you spend $15,000 to have her shipped home when it would be wonderful for her to be buried here in the Holy Land for just $150? Her husband thought about it for a moment and said, long ago a man died here and three days later, <laughs> three, three, day, three days later, he, uh, he rose from the dead, and uh, I just can't take that chance. So, thankfully, So again, uh, so the issue is tr really, the more we spend time with the Lord, through the Word, through communicating with Him, the more we trust Him, the more we love Him, the more we serve Him. And, and there's some models that we really have in Scripture. We have a model from Jesus that getting up early in the morning, let's, Mark chapter, I think it's chapter 1, says very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. Okay, why so early? I don't know about you. If I don't get up early, and there are many days I don't get up early, I'm done. It is downhill at 80 degrees. I, there's nothing to grab onto. So early in the morning, that's why Jesus got up, to be with his Father. It wasn't religious duty, it wasn't a holy hour of obligation. He wanted to be with his dad. And he did what he wanted to do. He needed to be with his Father. He went to a solitary place. Pretty much what Jesus tells us, what we read back in Matthew chapter 6. And so we can look at here, why pray? Well, there are great rewards to prayer. And they're not necessarily, though there can be, things. One, 
reward of prayer is the issue of joy. Look at what Jesus writes. John chapter 16. John records Jesus as saying this. Until now you have asked for nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive that your joy may be made full. See, God is about one thing above everything else. And that is our joy being made full. And the joy is a revelation of Him who is the embodiment of joy. So whatever you and I may receive is wonderful. But having received Him and experienced Him and the joy that He is, is all the more wonderful. And there's a big difference between joy and happiness. Joy and happiness are not synonymous. Okay, we're happy when good things happen. We're unhappy when bad things happen. Right? Our happiness is dependent upon what happens. And that's not what the Bible's talking about here. There can be a joy in the midst of the greatest sorrow. There can be joy when everything seems like it's falling apart because I know the one who has promised himself to me is never going to let me go. The Bible says that another reason to pray is to experience peace. Here's what the Apostle Paul writes. Now, this is a, a beautiful scripture, probably one of the first scriptures I really can remember hanging on to. Here's what Paul writes to the church in the land of Philippi. He says, Do not be anxious about anything. Do not be full of care. Do not be fearful about anything. But in everything, by prayer and petition or supplication, just asking with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will guard your hearts, your hearts, your emotions, will guard your minds, your intellect, in Christ Jesus. And so what he's saying here is above anything you ask for, ask thanking God that he's in control of your life. And then expecting that the God of peace will guard our hearts through what we're going through. Will guard our minds in the midst of what we're going through. Whatever we are going through. That doesn't necessarily mean we're going to get the specific answer that we want. But it will be opportunity to experience this God of peace in greater ways. Because prayer is not something we do to activate a, a Christian commodity of joy or peace. But prayer is an opportunity to have the manifestation of the very God of the universe who says, I want to know you and communicate with you. So the question is something that I think is important to us. Do I look to prayer just to change things? Or do I look to prayer primarily so that in the midst of whatever I'm going through and the prayer that I am bringing, the communication I'm bringing to God to ultimately change me. See, because prayer will not always change things. It may or it may not. But prayer that looks to God, that prayer, prayer that desires to know God more will always change the one praying. And it may be that God has orchestrated the events that you and I find ourselves in now to bring us into deeper trust and relationship, interaction, and communication with Him. So page 31, does God always answer prayer? Uh, yes, He always answers prayer. He answers prayer, yes. He answers prayer, not no, not now. He answers prayer, no. He answers prayer, you got to be out of your mind if you think I'm going to answer that. Um, and we need to understand too that oftentimes our lives can bring a barrier. If I'm not communicating with God or interacting with God or reading His Word and getting to know Him through His Word, that is going to sometimes form a barrier between me and God in terms of my knowing what to ask Him. 
It's going to affect my ability to hear, my desire to ask even. I love what John Stott says. He writes, he says, if God says no, the requests are either not good in themselves or not good for us or for others directly or indirectly, immediately or ultimately. Why? Because God sees beyond the point in time of which I'm asking. See, I see this, this space right here. I know what I want in this space here, so I think with the limited information I have. God sees how that is going to affect this and this and this and this, and I don't see that. So even in the midst of my saying, Father, I, I, I pray you will do this, but I don't see everything. And right now, I don't have a sense from you whether that's going to happen or not. But I know you know all things, and I'm trusting you right now, and I'm thanking you that you know what's going on here where I can see, but you also know what's going on here where I can't see. See, that's what God wants where he wants you and me. Jack Taylor, uh, beloved pastor, <laughs> teaching a message on this one, said, I believe I'm more grateful for the prayers God didn't answer or say yes to than I am, one, I am for the ones he did because it ruined me if he'd have answered what I was asking him for. You know, one of the ways, too, that we... That we you guys got your Alpha Bibles with you? Because we'll just take a quick minute, moment to do this. One of the ways that we... Um, a great way to pray and a great way to learn Scripture is to pray, pray Scripture back to God. Right? So if you just... Let's just go to um, the easiest one, just for sake of time. Psalm 23. Psalm 23 is on page 792. And so we can just take these songs or these psalms and we can just pray these back to God and there's ample... And matter of fact, we've got a handout for you tonight that'll help you to take, take with you and have some more time with that. Now, psalm 23. We, all, we, we know Psalm 23, right? If you've gone to a funeral, you've heard Psalm 23. You know, I would argue that you need to know this scripture before you're dead. It really would be helpful. Um, because there's so much good stuff for, for living people here. Uh, now, you know it. I mean, as, as you're looking at this, you say, I don't know the Bible. Well, here, this is in the Bible. You know something of the Bible. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. That's, or I shall not want. That's what you and I are familiar with. He makes me lie down in green pastures. So he refreshes. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. Well, let's turn that. Instead of just giving a narrative of information here, turn it this way. Lord, you are my shepherd. Because of you, I lack nothing. Lord, you make me lie down in green pastures. You are the one who leads me beside quiet waters. You refresh my soul. You guide me along the right paths for your namesake. Even though I walk through the valley, the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, Father, for you are with me. Your rod, your staff, they comfort me. Or you could say, or you could pray this another way. Go back to the beginning. It could become a prayer of thanks. Thank you, Lord, that you are my shepherd. Thank you that I lack nothing. Thank you that you make me lie down in green pastures. Thank you that you lead me beside quiet waters. Thank you that you refresh my soul. And you can even take your time doing this and think about the ways in which he has shown himself as your shepherd. Lord, thank you that you showed yourself as, as my shepherd those years ago when my bicycle was running headlong into a car and you turned my bike at the last moment. Your rod comforted me. <laughs> I remember that. Lord, you make me lie down in green pastures. I thank you for that. Think about that. Those quiet moments in the midst of the hell of this world that you've allowed him to have with you. Lord, thank you that you refresh my soul. Even now, maybe some of you guys, maybe Tuesday night is your lone moment of refreshment that you just sit and you think about the word. Thank you that you've guided me along the right paths for your namesake.
or I am trusting you. I don't know which direction I'm going in, but thank you. I'm trusting you to guide me along the right paths for your namesake. Even though I don't know where I'm going, even through the darkest valley, I will not fear. So these are just, I mean, I could go from scripture to scripture to scripture to give one example of another of just reading scripture back to God. God gave us scripture to read so that we would know him, so that we could communicate with him. So let, we can read it back to him. Now, probably the scripture, I, don't, I shouldn't say probably, the scripture that I think we all memorize, particularly if we grew up in a, a more traditional religion, whether it was Episcopalian or Catholicism or Methodism or Presbyterianism, any of those, um, is what we call the Lord's Prayer or maybe better said, the disciples' prayer. And, I, and, and instead of looking at that scripture as a... Um, you know how you prayed that prayer. I know how I prayed that prayer. I went to confession. I had to pray so many Our Fathers. And do you know how quickly I can say the Our Father? <laughs> I can say it faster than two all beef patty special sauce with cheese. I can say it faster now, imagine, I'm not making fun of saying the Our Father many times. That's not what I'm saying. I'm making fun of the way I said the Our Father many times. Imagine if you were having just a conversation with the person next to you, and you sped through what you're saying as quickly as possible, giving no thought to what you were saying, and then you repeated yourself. Giving no thought to what you were saying, and repeated yourself. And no thought to what you were saying and repeated yourself. Just so you could get saying that over with. How would you feel about that as a human being? I thought so. That's how I would feel about that. But what if we took this beautiful answer to a disciple's prayer. Lord, teach us to pray. And Jesus said... When you pray, pray, now listen to what he says, like this. In such a way that you would actually be communicating with the God who loves you and has given me you so he can be your father. And let's look at this now as the Our Father as a table of contents. The Lord's Prayer, the Disciples' Prayer as opposed to just something we go through, that we take time with. Chapter 1. Our Father, hallowed is your name. First thing, our what? Father. Now, if what the Bible says is true, there is only one way God can become my Father. And that is by Jesus becoming my brother and my accepting the work of the cross. To as many as received him, priests, to those who believe in his name, right? To them he gave the right to become children of God. So the way God becomes my father is I become his son, ladies, you become his daughter, and therefore I can say, Father in heaven. Holy is your name. Now you and I don't give much thought to name. Name is name. What are we going to name her? I like the name Amy. I like the name Joyce. I like the name Clarence. Uh, yeah, but the name means something. The name means something in that culture. Jesus is Jehovah salvation. God our salvation. That's what the name Jesus means. Or Jesus means. Or Joshua means. Jehovah, God our salvation. Holy is your name. And we can just look up scriptures that talk about the holiness of God. Or scriptures where the Bible says, calls God Father. Right? We, can, we can look at that. And we could spend time and have all kind of fun with that in chapter 1. Okay. Your kingdom come where? Your kingdom come in me where? 
See, when I surrender control of Him, I give Him the place in my life to rule. Your kingdom come. The kingdom of God has come into the lives of those who have surrendered to Jesus Christ. And I say, come and take over this life that I am progressively realizing I am not in control of and not doing such a great job with. Your king, it talks about being surrendered. And you can, we can look up one scripture after another that talks about God's kingship, his rulership, his authority. Your kingdom come. You know the next line. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Your will be done in me as it is in heaven. Placing God's will above mine. Think about, God, what is your will for me? What are the things you're concerned about? Lord, these are the things I'm concerned about. Your will be done in the relation, this broken relationship I have with this relative. This sickness that I have in my body. The fact that I don't have a job right now. Lord, your will be done in the fact that I don't know how we're going to have enough money to make it through the month. All of these things are opportunities for you and me to converse with God about. Give us this day our daily bread. Okay? Just, what do you need? God wants to know. Dad, our Father, wants to know. Tell Him. It's a good thing to pray for our daily needs. Our Father, a good Father, wants to know what those needs are. And He desires us to come to Him and be dependent on Him in every way. Here's a tough one. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Or forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who have trespassed against us. Here's the question. Father, is there anyone on this planet that I am harboring ill will toward? Is there anyone, Lord, that I have not forgiven that I think does not deserve to be forgiven by me? Okay, put your thinking caps on for a minute. I'm almost done. I'm way late again. I'm just throwing time out the window. Think about the worst thing you've ever done. There's no thought monitors here tonight, so you're safe. <laughs> worst thing you've ever done. I can tell you something worse that you've done. Who do you think you are? I'll tell you, something worse you've done. Something worse that I've done. I am responsible for hanging the Son of God on a cross because of my willful rebellion against God. And do you know what he did? He forgave me. I am guilty of crucifying the Son of God because I wanted to be God. I wanted to be the captain of my fate and the master of my soul. And he said, Frank, I forgive you. So who is that? that I am harboring any ill will or unforgiveness toward. Nothing could be worse than what I have done. And Lord, lead us not into temptation. Lord, keep me from the stupid decisions I often make. Deliver me from evil, from the evil one. you know the greatest and most uh, important prayer again is the one of surrender to him that communication that entrance that portal of communication to him is saying I do see I need you I do see I cannot work my way to you I can't be good enough I do see that and I need to talk to you about that right now tonight I see that maybe I'm convinced but I've never surrendered my life to you. I've never given control of my life to you. I never knew that I had to. I thought going to church was enough. I thought the, I thought the religious things that I did were enough. I see if the Bible's true, that's not true. It's not enough. The 
greatest prayer you and I will ever pray is I do, Jesus, give my life to you. You see, 2,000 years ago, Jesus Christ hung on a cross with his arms stretched out wide, blood coming from about every part of his body. Now hear me. And as he died, he looked straight into your eyes if you'd have been there. And he said, I do. He said, I do 2,000 years ago. According to the Bible, he said, I do before the foundation of the world. He is simply waiting for you and me to realize that what he did, I need. And so that I will turn to him. Stop turning my back on him and for once and for all, turn to him and look at him in his face, as it were, and say, Jesus, no more am I going to be married to myself in this world or everything that I think is so important. I choose you. I choose you. I'm forsaking all others. I know I won't be perfect. I know the times I'm straying. But I choose you, Jesus. I do. That's the greatest communication there is because that is the portal into intimacy with God. It is the portal into life abundantly. It is the portal into knowing Him and experiencing Him in ways that are beyond anything this world can give us. And have you considered that maybe Alpha is the way in which God has been drawing you to Himself to just simply receive the gift. I know it's late, but Sid, come on up real quick, buddy, if you would. Um, an element of prayer, uh, like I said, there are many ways to pray. Be quiet, read God's Word, talk to Him. I think actually, if we would have gone into more information tonight, just the way you and I live our lives, the way I go to work and I interact with my employees, do you know what God says that is? Prayer. Think about that. I'm seeing what you're doing, Frank, and it says something to, about you to me. That is communicating with me the way you're treating them, the way you're saying that. It's, it's prayer. Another way we pray, and a beautiful way we pray, is through the gift of song that God has given us. And tonight we have a former member of the Harvey, Jesus, and Fire Band. Praying for the real Jesus now. Praying for the Jesus that doesn't have the first name, Harvey. Um, Sid Bardfield. And Sid is just going to lead us in a song. You can sing it if you want. Uh, you can listen to it. That's not, the issue is not singing it. The issue is singing it. And it's a song called uh, Knowing You. Let me get this up. Oh, I love all this stuff that I had to pass by. Oh, gosh. This is taking me. Okay, here we go. But look at the words. You can just start. All I once held dear, built my life upon. All this world reveres and wars to own. All I once thought gain, I have counted loss, spent and worthless now, compared to this. Knowing you, Jesus. Knowing you, there is no greater thing. You're my all. You're the best. You're my joy, my righteousness, and I love you, Lord. You know, as we sing that, that can be your prayer to Him tonight. I'm just saying, there's nothing, no one better than you. No one makes a better offer than you. And tonight can be that night that you surrender to Him. So, Sid, if you would lead us, I'd appreciate it. Stand. Oh, yeah. can, okay. All I once held dear built my life upon all this world reveres and wars to own all I once thought gain I have counted loss spent and worthless now compared to this knowing you Jesus knowing you there is no greater thing you're my all you're the 
the best You're my joy, my righteousness And I love you, Lord All I once held dear Built my life upon All this world reveals And wars to win All I once thought gain I have counted loss Spent and worthless now Compared to this Knowing you joy my righteousness and I love you Lord now my heart's desire is to know you more to be found in you and known as yours to possess my faith what I could not surpass in gift of righteousness knowing you Jesus knowing you there is no greater thing you're my all you're the best you're my joy my righteousness you're my all, you're the best You're my joy, my righteousness You're my all, you're the best You're my joy, my righteousness And I love you, Lord You're my all, you're the best you're my joy, my righteousness, and I love you, Lord. Thank you, Sid, very much. Thank you, buddy. All right, well, let's take a quick break and get back to our tables. Thank you all so much for being here. Next week, we're going to be on How Can I Resist Evil, Session 7.